Hey there, independent musicians. Are you trying to understand how your songs and recordings generate the various royalties and worried that you might not be earning them all? I made a music royalties flowchart to map out all the different royalties and show you where to register yourself and your music to get them all. It's designed for independent musicians, but we look at other scenarios too. The royalties landscape changes often and is very complex, so just the main sources and types of royalties are addressed. See the video description for more information. Let's get going. Key concepts. Composition, recording, performance, sales. You composed a song. Great. You recorded your song. Nice. You're now a copyrighted songwriter and a copyrighted recording artist. You played your song at a public concert and sold your CDs during intermission. Congratulations. You've participated in the two main ways that music can make you money, performance and sales. Understanding these four terms, composition, recording, performance and sale, is a good starting point for an understanding of music royalties. Let's explore them further. The composition is your song, the original creation of melody, harmony, rhythm, and possibly lyrics. It may be a great song, but in legal terms, it's nothing. Only when the song is fixed into a tangible form does it acquire any legal recognition, that is, when the composition is set into a tangible form, it automatically acquires copyright. The most common tangible form nowadays is a recording in physical or digital form. Other tangible forms create copyright too, such as printed sheet music and lyrics, or even old cassette tapes. In fact, when original music is recorded, two copyrights are created, a copyright on the musical composition and a copyright on the recording itself. These copyrights identify the rights owners of the composition and the recording, giving them legal control over how the composition and recording may be used. Copyrights protect against improper use of the composition and the recording. For someone to legally use a composition or recording, a license must be obtained from the copyright owner. The licensee pays a royalty to the rights owner for the license. For example, if someone else wants to record a cover of your awesome song, she would have to pay you, the copyright owner, a royalty to obtain a license for that use. If a webcaster wants to play your recording, he too needs to acquire a license for that use and you'll receive a royalty. A quick word on license types. The most basic license is a direct, voluntary license between a rights owner and music user for a specific piece of music. In contrast, a blanket license permits the use of a large pool of music. A blanket license may be a statutory license established by law and a compulsory license because the rights owner cannot refuse granting the license. Those are the two copyrights, composition and recording. Next, there are two broad ways music can be used for commercial gain, it can be performed, and it can be sold. A performance of music occurs when music is heard in a public venue. A sale of music occurs when a copy of music is exchanged for money. More accurately, it is the act of copying and distributing music for sale, not the sale itself, that generates royalties. But for simplicity we'll call it a sale. To distinguish a performance from a sale, it's helpful to consider the intent of the person consuming the music. If that person intended or requested to listen to a specific piece of music from the supplier, that's considered a sale, even if no money is exchanged at that moment. Remember, it's the copying of music, not the exchange of money, that's important. In contrast, if the person is simply passively listening to whatever music happens to be delivered by the supplier, that's a performance. Another way to think about it is A sale occurs when the music consumer pulls music from the music supplier. A performance occurs when the music supplier pushes music to the music consumer. Properly distinguishing between sales and performances will become important later when building the royalty flowchart. To understand royalties, it is important to understand that performances and sales can occur for both compositions and recordings. A composition can be sold and performed. A recording can be sold and performed. 
In each of these four cases, a specific royalty for that use must be paid to the copyright holder of the composition or recording. And this takes us to the four main types of music royalties. Our four key terms and the four arrows connecting them give rise to the four main types of music royalties, master recording, mechanical, performance, and neighboring royalties. Let's take a closer look. To sell music commercially, copies of the recording are made and distributed with the intent to sell, which requires a royalty payment to the copyright holder of the recording. This royalty is known as the master recording royalty, which is really just a share of the sales revenue. But copying the recording also makes a copy of the composition embodied in the recording. This also requires a royalty payment to copy and sell the composition, this time to the copyright holder of the composition. This royalty is called the mechanical royalty. To perform music commercially, it must be caused to be heard in a public venue. The most obvious example is a live performance by musicians in a gig or concert. Live performances cause the songs to be heard in public and therefore require a royalty payment to the copyright holder of the composition. This royalty is logically called the performance royalty. A performance of music also occurs when a recording is played in public. This happens over digital and terrestrial radio stations, in restaurants and bars, shopping malls, etc. Anytime recorded music is played in public. Like a live performance, it is a performance of the copyrighted composition, so the performance royalty on the song must be paid. But, unlike a live performance, a recording is used for the performance, and it too, is copyrighted. So, logically, this accompanying or neighboring copyright should also generate a royalty payment for the performance of the recording. Right? Well, yes, it does. But not always. And there's our first complication. When this royalty is paid, it is broadly known as the neighboring royalty. However, in the US it's also called the digital performance royalty. Let me explain. Neighboring royalties are only fully recognized and paid outside the United States. In the US, only the digitally based, non-interactive streaming services pay neighboring royalties. These are the satellite, internet, and cable-based radio services like Sirius XM and Pandora. In contrast, traditional, over-the-air, terrestrial radio stations in the US do not pay these royalties. When the song on your CD is broadcast on YNOT radio, a performance royalty for the song is paid, but not the neighboring royalty for the recording. The reasons for this are historical, reflecting the politics between broadcasters and record labels going back many decades. Due to this difference between digital and traditional radio, the neighboring royalty paid by non-interactive digital streaming services in the US is instead called the digital performance royalty. So those are our four royalty types, master recording, mechanical, performance, and neighboring or digital performance. Now we can begin constructing our music royalty flowchart. Building the royalty flowchart. Let's go back to the beginning. You wrote a song, and you, or some other musician, recorded the song. Let's build a flowchart of the royalty pathways for this song and recording. Along the way, we'll define some terms. As we've seen, there are two main creations, the composition and the recording. A composition refers to the musical ideas, structures, and arrangement of the music, including the lyrics, if any. In popular music the composition is called a song. In the flowchart, the color orange indicates the composition. A recording refers to the realization of the composition into some tangible audio form. A recording thus embodies the composition. There can be many different recordings of one composition. In the flowchart, the color blue indicates the recording. The creator of the song is the songwriter or composer. The musician making the recording is the recording artist, featured artist, or just artist or performer. Both the composition and the recording carry copyrights. The unique identifying number for a composition is the ISWC, International Standard, Musical Work Code. The unique identifying number for a recording is the ISRC, International Standard Recording Code. The owner of the composition copyright is the songwriter, unless the songwriter confers the copyright to a publisher by entering into a publishing deal. 
The copyright on a composition is sometimes called a publishing right because of this relationship between compositions and publishing. The owner of the recording copyright is the recording artist, unless the recording artist confers the copyright to a record label by entering into a record label deal. The copyright on a master recording is sometimes called a label right because of this relationship between recordings and record labels. Independent songwriters and recording artists are independent because they don't enter publishing or record label deals. In doing so, they keep their copyrights. But they typically still need some of the services that publishers and labels provide. So instead, they can avail themselves of DIY, do-it-yourself, services. Independent songwriters can use a publishing administrator, and independent recording artists can use a distributor, sometimes called an aggregator, for these DIY services, and still maintain copyright ownership, and thus control, of their creations. The Four Principal Roles The above discussion introduces two more important role players into the mix. We know about the roles of the songwriter and recording artist. We now add the roles of publisher and record label. A publisher helps the songwriter promote and exploit his songs and manage the copyrights, licenses, and royalties for the songs. In return, the publisher will take ownership of some or all of the song's copyright. Similarly, a record label helps the recording artist record, distribute, and promote her recordings and manage the copyrights and royalties for the recordings. In return, the record label will take ownership of some or all of the master recording copyright. In this scenario, there are four separate entities carrying out the four principal roles. And the songwriter and recording artist have given up their copyrights to the publisher and record label. Remember, because copyright signifies ownership of the song and the recording, those rights owners have control over how the song or recording will be exploited. Musicians who want to be independent have other options. Instead of losing the song copyright by signing a publishing deal, the independent songwriter who wants to retain the copyright of his songs can use the DIY services of a publishing administrator. A publishing administrator provides many of the services of a regular publisher but does not take away any of the song copyright. By retaining the copyright, the songwriter becomes the publisher too, who is simply contracting out the administrative work to a publishing administrator. Likewise, the independent recording artist who wants to retain copyright and control of her recordings can instead use the DIY services of a distributor or aggregator, which provides many of the services of a record label but does not take any copyright. By retaining the copyright, the artist becomes the record label too, who is simply contracting out the administrative work to a distributor. Under this arrangement, there are now only two entities in charge of all four roles. Because he still holds the composition copyright, the songwriter is also the publisher, performing the publishing duties with the help of a publishing administrator. And, because she still holds the master recording copyright, the recording artist is also the record label, performing those duties with the help of a distributor. Finally, the recording artist and the songwriter might be the same person. That is, the songwriter both composed and recorded the song. In this case, the songwriter is the recording artist. So, if the songwriter does everything, composes the music, records the music, and publishes and distributes the music using the DIY services of a publishing administrator and a distributor, then he or she is the songwriter, recording artist, publisher, and record label, all in one. And because the publishing administrator and distributor take no copyright, the songwriter retains complete control over his or her musical creations, and receives all the royalties, after fees and commissions, of course. So, those are the four principal roles, songwriter, recording artist, publisher, and record label. If music is to generate royalties, all four duties must be performed by someone. No role or duty is optional. And it must be appreciated that nobody has a role, indeed nobody makes money, unless the songwriter composes some music in the first place. Okay, back to the flowchart. As mentioned earlier, Copyrights are created when the song is put into some fixed, tangible form. Traditionally, these tangible forms are physical things like vinyl records, cassette tapes, and CDs. Print forms like charts and lyrics are other options. More commonly today, tangible forms are digital, such as MP3, WAV, etc. Even though digital files are less tangible than physical products, they still create composition and recording copyrights. 
It is not necessary to register your copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office to create your copyright. But if you don't, you can't file a lawsuit against infringement of your copyright, and timely registration can increase your monetary damage award. As described earlier, these tangible recordings and the compositions they embody can be exploited commercially through performances and sales. Compositions are commercialized through publishing, and recordings are commercialized through distribution out to the public at large. Common sources of music royalties are, for example, playing music live at a gig or public concert, physical sales of CDs, vinyl records, etc., digital downloads of recordings, as for example, from iTunes, broadcast over so-called terrestrial radio, streaming on an interactive streaming service like Spotify, and digital jukeboxes like TouchTunes. Microsync, like in a YouTube video, is also included here. Streaming on non-interactive services like Sirius XM Radio, and business establishment music sources like Mood Media. In today's predominantly digital world, the digital service providers, DSPs, like Spotify, YouTube, Apple Music, Pandora, and many others are important distribution channels for getting music out to the public audience, accounting for most of the royalty sources shown here. There are, however, other less obvious sources not shown on this chart. Print royalties occur when printed music is copied, and lyrics royalties pay for copies of lyrics. Grand rights deal with music in dramatic performances like operas, musicals, and ballet. A private copy DART royalty is levied on sales of blank CDs to cover the copies of music made by private citizens. Sync royalties occur when specific agreements are reached to place music in film and TV. Then there's sampling, remixes, karaoke recordings, ringtones, and even interactive greeting cards. Each of the sources of music income listed in the flowchart generates a royalty of some kind. But how do we know what kind of royalty is generated? Linking royalty source to royalty type. Returning to our key concepts diagram, Remember that the four main royalties, master recording, mechanical, performance, and neighboring, depend on whether a composition is being sold or performed, or a recording is being sold or performed. Remember also that a performance of music occurs when the music consumer is passively listening to music, the music provider decides to play, while a sale of music occurs when the consumer intentionally selects the music to be played. Using this knowledge, we can determine what kind of royalty is generated. So, let's put the four royalty types on a single row in the flowchart and start drawing arrows from the royalty source to the four royalty types. For a sale, we'll use a double line arrow. For a performance, a dashed arrow. For composition, we'll use an orange arrow and for recording a blue arrow. Playing a live gig. We know this already. Playing your songs live is a performance. And because it's live, no recording is used. So it involves only the composition. It is therefore a performance of the composition, which generates a performance royalty. We use an orange, dashed arrow pointing to the performance of the composition. Physical sales. We also know this. Selling your CD generates a master recording royalty because copies of the recording are made and sold. So, this is a blue, double arrow, to the master recording royalty. And, as we already know, copying the CD also copies the songs embodied in the CD, so the mechanical royalty is also paid. This is therefore an orange, double arrow pointing to the mechanical royalty. Digital download. More precisely known as a permanent download. Here, someone has paid to download a copy of a specific digital recording. This is the same as selling a physical CD except the recording is digital. But that's irrelevant for royalties. Further note that no music is being heard during the download. So there is no performance of any kind. It's just a permanent download of a file that the buyer specifically requested. Just like the CD, the digital file and the compositions therein must both be copied. So, this is a sale and the same royalties, master recording, and mechanical, are generated. Again, we have a blue and orange, double arrow, just like physical sales. Interactive stream. Now it starts getting trickier. For an interactive stream, also known as an on-demand stream, 
the listener requests to listen to a specific song, often paying a fee for that convenience to the DSP, for example, Apple Music. Furthermore, this stream requires a copy of the digital recording to be made. All these factors indicate that a sale of the recording has occurred, thus generating a master recording royalty. And like a digital download, when a recording is copied and sold, the underlying composition is also copied and sold, generating a mechanical royalty. But, unlike a digital download, this is a stream where the consumer is actively listening to the song playing. Therefore, an interactive stream also generates a performance royalty on the composition. One might think that a performance of the recording is also done, requiring a digital performance royalty. But the fact that the listener had the intent to choose a specific song makes this a sale, not a performance, of the recording. One might question why an interactive stream generates a performance royalty when this royalty requires a public performance of the song, yet the listener may just be an individual listening to the stream alone at home. The reason is that, in the law, a public performance is qualified such that members of the listening public do not have to be listening to the stream at the same time or place. In other words, if the stream song is available to the public for streaming at any time or place, it's a public performance. So, an interactive stream generates three royalties, master recording, mechanical, and performance. A blue and orange double arrow, and an orange, dashed arrow. The interactive stream umbrella includes many sources. The obvious sources are the many DSPs that offer on-demand streaming, like Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube Music, etc. But it also includes digital jukebox services like Touchtunes and AMI, where patrons in business establishments, like restaurants, bars, etc., select and pay for song plays from the jukebox. The interactive stream category also includes so-called limited downloads as opposed to the permanent downloads described earlier. The playtime for a limited download, also called a conditional or tethered download, is limited by the DSP, and is therefore treated like an interactive stream in terms of royalties. Finally, microsync royalty sources are also included under the interactive stream umbrella. A traditional sync occurs when music is paired with moving images like film and video. A microsync is when the song is used within a video on social media streaming sites like YouTube. From the perspective of the song and how it is requested and delivered, a microsync is similar to an interactive stream. It only differs because of the video aspect. The user still has on-demand control, and the music in the video is copied and streamed just like an audio-only interactive stream. Therefore, like an interactive stream, the music in a microsync also generates master recording, mechanical, and performance royalties, the same three arrows. The term microsync royalties may be loosely used to refer to these royalties generally, in addition to royalties from the video itself. Non-interactive stream A non-interactive stream is essentially a digital radio station, either over satellite like Sirius XM, or via internet like Pandora Radio, or many other webcasters. Like a regular terrestrial radio station, but unlike an interactive stream, the listener cannot choose what song to hear. The DSP decides what songs to play and the listener listens passively. It's non-interactive. This indicates that a performance, not a sale, has occurred. And because a recording is being used, a digital performance royalty is generated for the performance of the recording. Likewise, a performance of the song embodied in the recording also generates a performance royalty. For a non-interactive stream, therefore, we have a dashed blue arrow pointing to the digital performance royalty and a dashed orange arrow pointing to the performance royalty. Remember, the digital performance royalty is the term used for the neighboring royalty in the U.S. where DSP radio services are concerned. The non-interactive stream umbrella includes several sources. The obvious sources are the DSPs that offer radio-like streaming, such as Sirius XM, iHeart, Pandora, etc. But it also includes business establishment music services like Mood Media that provide non-interactive background music to business establishments, restaurants, retail stores, etc. It also includes digital jukeboxes when they are in background music mode, that is, when no patron-selected song is playing. Terrestrial Radio So far, so good. But it gets more confusing with traditional, non-digital radio. 
The so-called terrestrial radio stations are those broadcasters transmitting music via AM and FM signals over the air from tall antennas. But other than the difference in the technology that delivers the music, there should be no difference from a digital DSP radio station, because it is a passive listening experience just like non-interactive digital radio. Therefore, it is logical to expect that terrestrial radio generates the same royalties as a non-interactive stream, namely, a performance of both the recording and the composition. But no. Due to historical and legal reasons, that is, the U.S. did not sign the Rome Treaty of 1961, terrestrial radio stations in the U.S. do not pay the recording performance royalty. They do pay the performance royalty for the composition, but not the neighboring royalty for the recording. Thus, the blue dashed arrow is a dead end in the U.S. In many countries outside the U.S., however, neighboring royalties are paid for terrestrial radio plays. In those countries, this royalty is known as a neighboring royalty because it goes side by side with the composition performance royalty. Again, in the U.S., only the subset of neighboring royalties that we call the digital performance royalty is recognized. Adding to the confusion, the terms neighboring royalty and digital performance royalty are often used interchangeably, despite their differences. To complicate matters further, even though neighboring royalties are paid outside the U.S., a recording from the U.S. that is played on a terrestrial radio station based overseas does not receive the neighboring royalty. It is generated by the broadcast, but if the artist, or, more accurately, the recording, is U.S.-based, it is not paid. This is because U.S. terrestrial radio stations do not pay neighboring royalties on any recordings, including those from outside the U.S. So, in return, those countries don't pay neighboring royalties on U.S. recordings. To sidestep this problem, a U.S. artist can earn neighboring royalties by making the recording in a country that recognizes that royalty. Even so, the artist would still not receive a royalty for the recording performance on a U.S. terrestrial radio station. But wait, there's more. At the time of this video, the American Music Fairness Act is before the U.S. Congress, which if enacted would compel terrestrial broadcast radio to pay the neighboring royalty. We now have all our arrows showing how the various royalties are generated. The master recording royalty is paid for physical sales, digital downloads, interactive streams, and microsync. These same sources also pay the mechanical royalty because, when copies of the recording are made, the song compositions embodied in the recordings are also copied. The performance royalty is paid for live gigs and concerts, both terrestrial and digital radio play, interactive streams, and microsync. Finally, the neighboring royalty is paid for both terrestrial and digital radio, except in the US where only non-interactive digital radio-like streams generate a royalty called a digital performance royalty. Now let's look at who pays, who collects, and who receives, these royalties. Who pays royalties? Royalties are paid by anyone using the music in any manner that is controlled by copyright, that is, anyone who wants to sell or perform a composition, or sell or perform a recording. The royalty is payment for a license to use the music in that manner. Obviously then, the DSPs and radio services pay the various royalties as shown in the flowchart. They cover these costs from advertising and subscriber revenues. For a live gig or concert, the venue or promoter is responsible for paying royalties, paid from event revenue. Providers of physical products and digital downloads pay royalties when copies are made, and recoup that cost from buyers of those products. If you're a musician who records a cover song, either you or the record label owns the master recording, but you must pay the mechanical royalty to acquire a license for the copies of the song composition in your recordings. You can obtain the mechanical license from the song's publisher, an MRO, or cover song licensing agencies such as EasySong. However, as of 2021 under the Music Modernization Act, you do not have to pay the mechanical royalty for interactive streams on the larger DSPs that use the blanket license from the MLC. More on the MLC later. In the final analysis, because everyone is in this business to cover their costs and make money, all royalty costs are ultimately passed down to the final consumer, that is, buyers of physical products and downloads, subscribers to streaming services, concert goers, and purchasers of products being advertised. Who collects, and who receives, royalties?
Various organizations collect royalties and forward them on to the final payees. The complexities of the royalty flow chart continue because who collects what and who is paid depends on the arrangements that the songwriters and recording artists have made. Who collects what and who is paid for a completely independent musician will not be the same as a musician who signed up with a publishing company and or a record label. It will also depend on whether the musician is based in the US or not. This flowchart is mainly targeted to the completely independent musician based in the US, who both writes and records his or her own music. So, let's start with that scenario. Along the way we'll point out some variations from this scenario. Once you, the independent musician, have written and recorded your own songs, you've got the tangible form that creates the composition and recording copyrights. As described earlier, you are also, by default, the publisher and the record label because you have not entered into any deal signing away your composition and recording copyrights. But, as an independent publisher and record label, you will need help from the DIY services to commercially exploit your music and earn money from royalties. Master Recording Royalties Accordingly, you retain the services of a distributor to get your recordings out to the DSPs so the public can enjoy them and royalties can be generated. Because you signed up with the distributor and delivered your recordings to it, they know who you are and what recordings you own via the ISRC number. So, it makes sense that your distributor also collects the master recording royalties from the DSPs on your behalf. The distributor then takes its commission. For example CD Baby Standard, which the author uses and recommends, charges 9% and pays the rest to the record label. But under the independent musician scenario, you are the record label. So you, as the record label and recording artist, are paid the master recording royalties. Note that other distributors charge differently for their services, but the royalty flow is the same. Your distributor should also collect the master recording royalties from international sources. Variation If you have signed with a record label, they will commonly take the place of the distributor. You will no longer be the record label, just the recording artist. They will also acquire some, maybe all, of your recording copyright, so you will receive much less, or none, of the master recording royalties. Your royalty flowchart would look like this. The record label should offer other services and advantages in return, such as advances and marketing. Performance Royalties Performance royalties originating in the U.S. are collected by performing rights organizations, or PROs. The most common PROs are ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. Based on song usage surveys, the PRO collects performance royalties from the various sources and pays them out. 50% to the songwriter and 50% to the publisher. However, the PRO needs to know whom to pay and for which songs the payee owns the copyright. So, to receive your 50% as a songwriter you need to register or affiliate as a songwriter with a PRO. And you also need to register all the songs you own with the PRO. If you don't, you won't receive your songwriter performance royalties. Furthermore, under our independent songwriter scenario, you are also the publisher. And to receive your other 50% publisher share, you must also affiliate separately with the PRO as a publisher. If you don't affiliate as a publisher, you won't receive that half of your performance royalties. The requirements for affiliating as a publisher vary somewhat with the PRO you use. Getting set up with a PRO is one reason the DIY services of a publishing administrator are convenient. If you sign up with a publishing administrator, they will register with the PRO on your behalf and pay you the publisher performance royalties. The publishing administrator can also register you as a songwriter and handle all the song registrations with your PRO. For these services, the publishing administrator charges a commission. For example, SongTrust, which the author uses and recommends, takes 15%. But importantly, the publishing administrator will not take any of your song ownership you still retain all your composition copyright. Performance royalties originating outside the U.S. are collected by collective management organizations, or CMOs. Through reciprocal agreements with overseas CMOs, your PRO here in the U.S. can collect international performance royalties. Alternatively, a publishing administrator should have direct affiliations with overseas CMOs and be able to register your music directly with them 
resulting in more efficient collection. Variation. If you have signed a deal with a publisher, they will take the place of the publishing administrator. You will no longer be the publisher, just the songwriter. They will also acquire some of your composition copyright, so you will receive much less of the performance and mechanical royalties. Your royalty flowchart would look like this. The publisher should offer other services and advantages in return. Mechanicals. Frankly speaking, the collection of mechanical royalties is confusing. Generally speaking, mechanicals are collected in the U.S. by mechanical royalty organizations, generically known as MROs, such as the Mechanical Licensing Collective (MLC), Harry Fox Agency (HFA), and Music Reports (MRI). Internationally, the CMOs collect mechanicals in addition to performance royalties. As a composition royalty, mechanicals ultimately end up being paid to the publishing side of the flowchart. Here, to the publishing administrator. Recently created in 2021, the Mechanical Licensing Collective has facilitated the administration of interactive streaming mechanical licenses and royalties through a blanket licensing arrangement with the major DSPs for all songs registered with the MLC. Unlike other MROs, independent songwriters can sign up and register their songs with the MLC directly. Alternatively, a publishing administrator can do this work for you, like it does with a PRO. Note that the MLC only collects mechanicals from within the US. For other voluntary, non-blanket licensing situations, arrangements and royalty payments are made through HFA, MRI, etc., or directly with the rights owner. This might be the case for cover songs for physical recordings and downloads, for streaming with some smaller DSPs and websites that do not use the MLC's blanket license, and for sync deals. For the independent musician, these deals can be complex, and the DIY services become nearly essential. Further complexities exist. In the US, mechanicals for physical sales and some digital downloads are typically collected by the record label or distributor first, and then pass through to the MRO or direct to the publisher. This reflects the historical fact that mechanicals existed long before streaming, they originated back when player piano rolls were copied. And because they are generated when the associated recording itself is copied, these mechanicals naturally flow with the master recording royalties to the record label or distributor first, who then forwards them on to the final payee. The same similarity with physical product does not exist with mechanicals for interactive streaming, which additionally generates a performance royalty. As stated earlier, streaming mechanicals now flow primarily through the MLC in the US. The MLC also collects permanent digital download mechanicals when other arrangements are not in place for the distributor or label to collect them. Mechanicals of any type, originating from outside the US, are collected by the numerous CMOs around the world. It would be nearly impossible for an independent musician to set up relationships with all these CMOs to reap the international mechanical royalties. But your publishing administrator has also done this work for you, and can collect international mechanicals on your behalf. With the other advantages mentioned earlier for the collection of performance royalties, this is yet another reason to use a publishing administrator. Obviously, while the rationale for paying mechanical royalties is straightforward, understanding the various ways in which they are collected is difficult. But, regardless of the complexity, the takeaway point is that as an independent songwriter, you do not need to worry exactly how your mechanical royalties arrive into your bank account. If you have the proper DIY services in place, with a good distributor and publishing administrator, they'll take care of it. Variation Let's say you don't deal with any publishing arrangements or the MLC at all. In this case you could still register with a PRO to receive your songwriter performance royalties but you would miss out on your publisher performance royalties and you would also forfeit all your mechanicals from both the US and overseas. Your royalty flowchart would look like this. Digital Performance, Neighboring Royalties As explained earlier, these recording performance royalties depend on whether the recording was made in the US or overseas. Outside the U.S., in countries with Western-style economies, this royalty is called a neighboring royalty and is paid for any performance of the recording. In the U.S. it's called a digital performance royalty and is only paid for non-interactive streams, not terrestrial radio. 
In our independent, US-based musician scenario, you, as the featured recording artist and record label, are due digital performance royalties. How do you receive them? In the US, digital performance royalties are collected by Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange then pays 50% to the distributor, which, after commission, is passed on to you in your capacity as the record label. As shown before, if you have signed a record label deal, the record label has replaced the distributor, so Sound Exchange would pay the record label directly. It will then depend on your label deal how much you will receive. This 50% Sound Exchange distribution is often called the label share. The other 50% goes to the musicians who performed on the recording. 5% goes into a fund managed by the Musicians Union for session musicians, backup vocalists, and other non-featured musicians. The other 45% is due to you in your capacity as the featured recording artist. This 45% sound exchange distribution is known as the artist share. However, just like you have to sign up with a PRO for your composition performance royalties, you have to sign up with sound exchange as the artist or performer to receive your 45% artist share of the digital performance royalties. If you don't, you'll lose almost half your digital performance royalties. Furthermore, as a fully independent musician, you are the record label. You can therefore also register directly with Sound Exchange as the rights owner. You will then receive the label share directly from Sound Exchange, avoiding the distributor's commission, and your flowchart would look like this. But this is optional, and because registering as the rights owner is more involved than just registering as an artist, it may be worth paying the commission to simply have your distributor collect the label share for you. Finally, remember that recordings made and played on terrestrial radio outside the U.S. earn international neighboring royalties, collected by the CMOs. Sound Exchange can collect these royalties but only if you specifically enroll in the international mandate when you sign up with them. Get it all. As an independent musician based in the U.S., to get all your royalties, who do you sign up with and what royalties do they pay? First, sign up with a distributor. The distributor will distribute your recordings out to the world. They will then collect and pay your master recording royalties, the label share of your digital performance royalties, and some of your mechanical royalties as well. Also, make sure your distributor has arrangements with the social video platforms to get your royalties from MicroSync use. Next, register with a PRO. They will collect and pay your songwriter performance royalties from the US. Then, sign up with a publishing administrator. They will collect and pay your publisher performance royalties from the US and all performance royalties from overseas. They will also pay your mechanical royalties from the US and overseas. Also, make sure your publishing administrator has arrangements with the social video platforms to get your royalties from MicroSync use. Next, register with Sound Exchange as an artist with the international mandate. This will pay the artist share of your digital performance royalties from the US and overseas. Finally, support the American Music Fairness Act to change the law so that neighboring royalties become recognized in the US and we all get paid for performances of our recordings on terrestrial radio. Remember, as an independent recording artist, you are the record label and will receive all the label royalties. And, as an independent songwriter, you are the publisher and will receive all the publishing royalties. And, if you're both, the fully independent songwriter and the fully independent recording artist, you'll get it all. Last, but not least, it must be appreciated that the composer-songwriter is the one indispensable role here. No one else has a role, indeed nobody makes any money. Not the publishing company, or administrator, not the record label, not the PRO, MRO, CMO, or the distributor, or sound exchange, not the DSPs, or the radio stations, not the clubs, and concert promoters, not even the recording artists. Truly no one has a purpose unless the composer-songwriter creates some music first. So there you have it, a music royalty flow chart. I hope it helps you, the independent musician, earn all the royalties you deserve and are owed. If so, consider a like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and may your music royalties flow strong, like a river.